Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have a really nice little rotary wristwatch, probably from the late 50s or so. Uh, rotary is a brand that isn't really around anymore, but back in the day, they made reliable, solid timepieces like this one out of Switzerland. And uh, these were, you know, kind of everyday wear it every day worker type watch. And uh, that's exactly what we have here. This one, however, is not running and it hasn't been for, oh, a few years at least now, according to the owner who contacted me uh, via the Patreon for this channel. He's a patron of the, ch of the show. And uh, he asked me if I could take a look at this watch. He said it wasn't running and also it's doing some weird things. As you can see, it has one of these old school uh, flex bracelets. Ooh, and it has a little bit of dirt and grime built up in there Oh yeah, that's pretty bad. So we'll need to get that thing cleaned up. But uh, yeah, this watch actually belonged to his father. His father was named Jim Hume. And Jim was a, had a, quite a life. He was born in England, but moved to Canada in 1948 to cover politics, which he did for over 70 years in British Columbia, uh, even all the way up until he was 98, still writing every single week. Um, but that led him to have quite a life over here. He's got a big family, as you can see. And um, this watch that we have here was his watch for a good chunk of his career. And it had some adventures of its own, including dinner with the queen and salmon fishing with John Wayne, among others. So pretty crazy. And let's see how this thing's actually working, because I would love to get this back on the... Whoa, what the... Did you see that? Oh. <laughs> I'm actually just winding the watch here and the hands are jumping around in kind of a crazy man. Wow, I have never seen that before. What is going on with this thing? Well, that is what we're going to find out here today. You and I are going to go on a little journey together and uh, we're going to figure out what the heck is going on with this watch and see if we can't get it all fixed up and uh, working again so that uh, Jim's son can wear it. Now, taking a look at the back of this thing, you can see it's smooth. Now, normally you'll see those grooves in the back of the watch that we can use to uh, use the case opening tool to open it up. And when you don't see that, it usually means it's a snap on back. And that means you need to find the groove and you see it right there. That is for a case knife. So there's a small groove in the back and you put the case knife in and press and then it'll open up the back of the watch just like this. There we go. And that'll allow us to take the case back off and take a look at the movement. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, this is one of those ones. So on this one, you do release the back, but actually the whole entire front comes off. <laughs> and there we can get a little look at the dial. It looks pretty good for its age. Apparently Jim wore this thing every day from when he got it up until, yeah, a few years ago when it stopped working. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be our job to uh, remedy that. So we'll start off by taking the hands off. now. Getting them all perfectly aligned seems like a dream that's not going to happen here. So I'm just going to go ahead and take them off. It looks like I can do so pretty safely, though. There we go. And I've got a special box to put the hands in. It just protects them so that while I'm working on the watch and cleaning and lubricating and polishing and any other stuff that we end up doing, that the hands are uh, protected. And then I can just remove the movement from the uh, case back here. It just sits in there naturally. Ooh, movement looks pretty good. You can see it's all brass here. Let's check to make sure. Oh, this is good news. The, uh, the balance wheel spins freely. And that means that we have a much better chance of just doing a service and getting this thing back in action. Give it a quick test wind. Hmm, did you hear that? So when you get to the very end of winding up a watch like this, a manually wound watch, it should catch. It should basically not let you wind it any further. But I heard a noise that sounded like it was letting go, like it, you know, kind of let go and it was spinning. And that's not good news. That means that something's going on with the mainspring for sure. And uh, it could be that uh, it's broken. It could be that it's not catching on the arbor. It could be that it's not catching on the barrel wall. And uh, we're just going to have to investigate that later. I might just need a new mainspring anyway. Yeah, and I just let the power out of the mainspring and it looked like there was almost none in there, even though I wound it up a bunch. 
And that means that it's not holding its power, which is definitely our, our first place to look as far as why the, uh, the watch isn't running. Now, it doesn't solve the weird hands issue necessarily, so we've still got a little bit more research to do yet. First thing I'm gonna do is take off the balance here as we begin our journey into uh, servicing this watch and doing some troubleshooting and repair on it. Now we can continue with the disassembly on the top part here. Of course, the process here is, <laughs> it's weird. It's very uh, straightforward, but it's also very complicated. It's kind of weird that it's both of those things, but it is straightforward in the sense that it's just take everything apart, clean it and put it back together. I mean, that, that that's it. There's no, you know, there's no adhesives, there's no welding, there's no nothing like that, no riveting really. It's just screws and and plates and stuff like that. So it's straightforward in that way. But of course, when you see this watch completely taken apart, you'll say, oh, okay, well, I get, I get why he said it wasn't that straightforward. <laughs> okay, now we can take the click and the click spring off. You can see I use this uh, black stick here to make sure that the spring stays in place because they tend to kind of want to jump away. Oh my God, it just jumped away. Oh, where did it go? Please don't be gone. Oh, okay, okay, I see it on my lap. Oh, we got lucky. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's one of those ones where, uh, you know, sometimes the flashlights, flashlights and the magnets need to come out. But uh, looks like we got away with one here. So I'm gonna turn the watch over and start uh, taking apart the calendar works as well. You can see there's kind of a plate that holds the calendar disc the date disc as it's called in place. So we'll start by removing that so that we can take the disc itself off. There we go. And now the disc will come free. And we can set that aside. Now this uh, little part over here is called the date jumper. And it's what applies pressure to that date disc so that when it goes around, it has a little bit of tension on it. And the tension is provided by this spring here, which I really don't need to jump away on me, please. Okay, actually this one was uh, under no tension, so whew, no worries there. This part here is a spring that pushes on a special part that kicks over the calendar in one motion. So if you look at some uh, calendar watches, when it starts to be get close to midnight, you'll see the little calendar start to shift over and it'll kind of slowly go over, eventually getting to the next day. But on watches like this that have this extra part, instead, right when it hits midnight or whenever you set it to, it'll snap over the date in one motion. It's really nice. Okay, we can take off the hour wheel now. And it looks like there's a little bit of a plate here. And then this, I think we can just continue the disassembly on the other side now. So we'll start by taking off, there's usually two plates on top or bridges, if you will. And this is kind of the bigger one on most watches. It's called the train wheel bridge. And you'll see the wheels underneath it once it comes off. There they are. And we can start to remove these wheels now. This one doesn't want to come out. There it is. Oh, that's a weird one. Oh, okay. That's one of those ones. Right, right, right. I've worked on one of these movements before, one of these types. I see. So you can see this one has this weird setup on the bottom of it um, with kind of two different wheel things there. That could be part of where our issue is with the uh, with the hand setting because what that is is it's a friction fit pinion that sits on top. So it's like a gear that sits on top of a wheel. And it's meant to be friction fit, but only to a point. Meaning that it isn't meant to be pressed on and stayed there. It's meant to be pressed on and it can be turned under pressure, but only if directly imposed upon. So 
That is actually how the cannon pinion works on the other side too, but this watch doesn't have a proper cannon pinion like we're used to. Instead, they opt for this pinion attached to one of the wheels instead. I actually don't know why um, some of the companies opt for this. The Canon pinion method seems to be the more reliable and widely used option, but this movement does not have it. All right, and I dropped a screw a minute ago, and there it is, and that leaves almost this thing completely stripped down. The only part left here is the pallet fork bridge. Okay. And that means that we can take off the pallet fork bridge and then the pallet fork underneath it. There's the bridge. And then the pallet fork is pretty delicate and you can see it right there. Okay, so we've got this side of the movement all taken apart. Now we can uh, finish taking apart the other side. Setting lever screw and setting lever both come off before turning it over. And now we can finish up by taking off this little plate that covers up what looks to be the hour wheel and the minute wheel perhaps. And then, well, I don't know what it's called. It's not the cannon pinion anymore because it doesn't uh, have any friction on it, this, this middle part. In fact, you'll see normally I have to use a special tool to take that off, but this time it'll just come off on uh, with no, no force whatsoever. Okay, that's for the calendar. And I'm gonna go ahead and take apart the keyless works or what's left of it. We'll start, oh yeah, here's the cannon pinion. So again, not that isn't, that isn't actually put on via friction like it normally would be. And again, that's because it uses this other, uh, this other system. Okay. Good, just a couple of more parts to take off here before we have the watch completely disassembled. This is the yoke and then the yoke spring. And once again, not under tension, so not as worried about it, it flying away. I think one spring flying away or attempting to is, is enough for me, thank you very much. Now just for safekeeping, I'm gonna put the balance bridge and the balance wheel, and they call it the balance complete back on. And that way, when I push, when I put this whole thing through the watch cleaning machine, that that part can get all cleaned up, but not be at risk of getting hit or pulled or damaged by something else. Okay, now let's take a look at this mainspring and see what's going on with it. First off, is it intact? Yes, it is. Although it looks like maybe the arbor was not. Whoa, hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, one of those days, huh? All right, all right. Well, let's just uh, keep trucking along. Um, yes, that barrel arbor there looks like it was not fully seated with the spring, which I'm gonna blame for it flying away on me though. It was really just my fault. Um, that could have been though part of the reason why uh, the main spring was slipping. So we'll have to investigate. And then last but not least, this, could, this watch's crystal is actually in pretty good shape, but probably could use a new one. So we'll just take out the old crystal here it's got some scuffs and some marks on it and probably just would be better to replace it at this point. Though that kind of thing can be restored. I just find that a new crystal is usually a better way to go. Okay, so now everything needs to go into the watch cleaning machine and that means putting the really small parts into these little mesh baskets so that they can't get lost in there because they are gonna be submerged in some liquid and uh, you don't need little screws and springs ending up in the bottom of your cleaning jars, which uh, absolutely can happen. So there we go, everything, the whole watch goes into this thing and now we can put it into the watch cleaning machine here. This is the uh, top down view of what it looks like and it's a pretty straightforward machine. It puts it through three different stages of cleaning and then a drying process and as you can see, it's kind of old school. And while I do clean up this uh, watch, I did want to mention that I've got a Patreon for this channel. That's a way that you can support your favorite content creators. And if you like what I'm doing here on the channel, I'd love it if you check out the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. Everybody who signs up gets a wristwatch revival sticker and a thank you card in the mail. And I just wanted to say extra special thanks to everybody who supports me over on Patreon. It really does mean the world. 
Okay, so here's the parts all laid out and beautiful after coming out of the watch cleaning machine. And they are looking lovely and like they're ready to be put back together. And that is exactly what we are going to do now. So we're gonna start the reassembly process with this mainspring barrel, the mainspring itself, the cap, and as well as the uh, the arbor. And uh, I'm gonna just try to make sure that the that everything seems to go back together correctly here because it did seem like there was an issue with this, but looking at it, I don't see any issue with any of the parts. Uh, there's no obvious worn parts or anything like that. So it could have just been that the mainspring wasn't catching. Um, as we saw when I took, took it apart, it looked like the arbor wasn't really seated correctly with the spring itself. And that could have just perhaps happened inside of the barrel and been part of the reason why it wouldn't wind up. Not 100% sure, but we're going to give it a shot as is and see how it goes. And as you can see, I'm going to use my mainspring winders here to uh, put the mainspring back into the barrel. This winds up the entire mainspring into this tool, which then lets you safely place the mainspring back in the barrel without any bends or debris or anything like that. So I can remove the winder part of the tool. And then as you can see, it'll just leave the mainspring in that tube. There it is. And now I can put it back into the barrel itself. And this of course is one of my favorite parts about watchmaking. It's such a nice feeling to know that that mainspring is back in there safe and sound. And now I can put the arbor back on as well. And let's make sure that it sits. Yeah, that looks fine actually. That I wonder if it just came out in there and that maybe was part of the reason uh, for the issues with the watch. Again, that wouldn't really explain the hands jumping around like that, but uh, it could explain why the mainspring wasn't able to hold a full wind. I've got this little tiny plastic tool that I use here to help put the lid back on safely as well. Just like that. Okay, so that looks good. Um, We'll have to see when we get the watch all the way back together to make sure that it's functioning properly. But to me, that looks about right. That's what you want to see. So now we can put the train of wheels back in. We'll start with the escape wheel. Escape wheel is always really easy to identify because it stands out so much. It's different color and it has that weird shape. And here's the part with that friction pinion wheel that I mentioned before, the one that kind of replaces the cannon pinion uh, as far as functionality goes. And that's the one that I kind of have my eye on. But for now, I'm just gonna see if just a straight up service of this watch would be enough to get it back to running condition and resolve those issues that we had seen. Okay, last of the train wheels goes into place. It's a nice little movement. Like I said, these rotary watches and these movements were off the shelf uh, movements as well, meaning that the company that made this watch just bought these movements from a movement manufacturer and put them into their designed case and dial and hands and all that stuff. But they were totally fine. I mean, this thing ran forever until it finally gave up the ghost a little while ago. I think it was eight or nine years ago or something that it stopped running and then its owner, Jim, just threw it in a drawer and said, it's not running anymore. Okay, now we can put the uh, barrel bridge on to, into place. Yeah, what a crazy life he had, the owner of this gym. Uh, he, I mean, he was writing a blog at age 98 that people were reading. That's just incredible to me. You know, you look at the type of stuff that he started off working on, you know, mechanical typewriters when he started his career. And by just the end of one career, he was managing his own website. Like, <laughs> kind of puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Okay, now the tricky bit here on putting on the uh, 
train wheel bridge is to get all the pivots lined up as best we can. Ooh, oh, not quite. I think, it feels like I, okay, I think I do have it. Let's test, yes, there we go. That actually wasn't too bad. Um, yeah, these movements are pretty well made. This is a, an AS1900 move, whoa, don't you jump away again. That's the one that jumped away earlier. Uh, no. Sit. Oh, that's better. All right. <laughs> Back to business. Yeah, so this is an AS1900. These are, these were used in all types of watch brands back in the day. Taking a look at it now, yeah, I would assume early 60s for this watch. When I first saw it, I was thinking later 50s, but uh, this, this watch actually has a few features in it that are a little more typical for... Uh, a few years down the line. You can kind of get an idea for the time frame for a watch based on the technology that they had for watches, uh, how many jewels they used and, and which types there were. Shock protection is a big one. Okay, now we can continue with the rebuild here on the watchmaker side of the watch. And again, this is the winding works. So this is the part that lets you wind the mainspring. That part's called the ratchet wheel. And we'll secure the ratchet wheel here. And there we go. And that'll allow me to grab the crown wheel. And put it into place. Oh. And I'm just gonna put a little dot of oil here where the screw meets up with that wheel because it does need to rotate underneath it and I don't want any undue friction there. This is a reverse threaded screw, meaning that you turn it the opposite way that you'd think. It's very weird. A lot of time when people start working on watches at the beginning, they'll strip out those screws because they think that they're just stuck and they're actually screwing it in the wrong direction. Now we can flip the watch over though and start working on the keyless works. Again, this is a fairly straightforward watch. The most complicated thing about this particular one is that it has that date function. And, you know, that's not too bad. I've worked on quite a few of those these uh, by now. Okay. This is called the sliding clutch. And anytime you see me using that red oil, that is a medium viscosity oil. It's one that's meant to be for parts that have a bit of friction to them, but not heavy like a bigger wheel like this where it meets up with the post. The blue stuff is kind of the hardcore grease. And then there's a really light blue one that I'll use uh, just for the pivots and stuff. That's like the lightest oil so that it's the most efficient. Now I can put on the setting lever, but in order to do so, I have to kind of pick up the whole movement so I can get to the other side. It's a little bit of a tricky operation, but looks like I've got it. And now we can take the winding stem and crown. And I'm gonna go for the grease here. Again, you don't have to use very much, but this is kind of the, the thickest of the oils that we have or, or greases. All right, and now we can put the stem in and make sure that it is engaging properly. and a little bit of grease on the post here because I'm gonna be putting on the yoke. And the yoke is uh, definitely a high friction part. It's In fact, its whole job is to apply pressure. And that means that it needs to have a pretty thick spring and it's gonna be under quite a bit of tension and that's where you wanna use the grease. And there's that pretty thick spring right now. Okay. 
Well, that was pretty drama free. I'll take it. Make sure that this is all seated correctly. And then I can continue by putting on the setting lever spring, which is kind of a dual part. It, it adds, it acts as both uh, a spring, which is that kind of arm in the middle, but also as a cover plate just to make sure things stay in place. Okay. So now we can do some test winds here. Huh? That's actually a little bit weird. Let's take a look at this thing on the microscope. So as you can see, it's in the winding here, which that should be turning. But when I pull out the stem to do hand setting, the wheel here is still turning. Uh, excuse me, the barrel is still turning. And if you look here, this is in the handset position. And for some reason, the barrel is turning as well. And that's not right. And I have a hunch as to what this might be. And I think it's this part here, this weird one. Now take a look at the base where it connects to the wheel and watch. Do you see how it turns freely of that wheel? That means that it's not properly connected to the wheel and that probably the top part is seized together or at least too stuck to be functional. And that I believe is why the hands were flying around even in just the winding position. So we're gonna have to unfortunately rewind a little bit here and take back apart a good chunk of the watch so that we can get back to this part right here because I ordered another one. Um, I figured we would try just using a new one. I'm not new, but one off of a, a donor watch and I will service this part and then see how it actually, if that solves our problem or not. So to service it, I need to take it apart. So I need to take that friction fit part on the top and remove it from the part that it's on. And so I'm going to use this little tool to do so. And I should just need to kind of push to separate the two. like this, and yeah, there we go. So that came apart nicely. And now I can remove the bottom part from that top part like that, and we can inspect it on the microscope and see what we're looking at here as far as these go. And there we go. There is some rust in there, which inevitably means that it wasn't spinning freely. So I'm gonna do a clean job on this. I'm gonna start off by just getting some of the excess debris and rust off with uh, some Rodico here. Just another use for it is cleaning up small parts like this. And then what I'll do is I'll put it in the ultrasonic cleaner as well, just to see if I can't get any more of, of any type of corrosion off of there. And then we'll see what we end up with uh, after that's done. So after putting in the ultrasonic, this is what we have much, much better. As you can see, there's no uh, debris or anything on there. And I'm assuming that it's connected properly to the wheel. And this should, uh, this should do a good job for us here. If it was only this top part, then I could have just serviced the original pinion. But the fact that it wasn't on the wheel properly meant that we needed to replace it. So I'm going to use some grease here um, as the in-between, and I'm going to use my staking set to push them back together. I don't want to apply uh, too much side pressure to it, so I'm going to use a post on the top and just press it firmly into place. Just like that. And what that should do is allow it to stay connected and spin normally, but then when uh, pressure is applied to just the top half, it should turn on its own. So. Now that I've got that all put back into the watch, we can continue with the rebuild and then we'll test it out when we actually get the hands on it. The watch hands, that is. So next up on the docket here are the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge. Now what, you, what I like to do is tighten it down most of the way and then make sure that the pallet fork is properly seated like that. See, it wasn't actually properly seated even though it kind of looked like it. Then I'll hold it down and finish screwing down that bridge. So first up, let's see how the winding works. That looked good already. And now we can make sure that there's actually some power flowing down to the fork. And yep, there is. So that's good. And that means the moment of truth is upon us here, at least one of our moments of truth. First, can we get this watch running? And that's going to mean putting in the balance and seeing if this watch will kick up. This will answer at least part of our questions. Come on. Ooh. 
Please? No? Oh! Okay, it looks like it wants to go. And there it goes! Fantastic! So now we've got a running watch again. And uh, that is a huge step forward for this timepiece. So now it's, uh, it's running and uh, we can get it regulated and, and hopefully keeping good time. Now the hands thing we still don't know about, but this is a big step. So fantastic. And I'm really happy about it. And now we can continue with the rebuild. Now, I mentioned that uh, it's kind of a three-step process, right, of putting it all back together or taking it apart, putting it all back together and then lubricating it. And that's the part we need to do now is the lubrication part. So the first thing we'll do is lubricate these cap jewels. So these are two piece jewels. As you can see, I can remove this one and then there's a jewel underneath that has a hole in it. And this one is flat like a cap. And what that means is, is that we can place a small droplet of oil on the cap and then secure it to the top and it'll suspend that oil right above the hole and uh, it'll allow the watch to run not only very freely and efficiently, but also for a very long time. But in order to do this, we need to clean these caps because they can have dried on oil or debris on them and even the tiniest amount can inhibit the watch from running at its full potential. So we put them in a solvent, let them sit for a little bit and then take them out and now I can take my oiler, which is just like a special metal stick here, and I can place a small droplet of oil right in the center here of this uh, cap jewel, just like that. That is exactly what you wanna see. Now I can take the cap jewel itself and very carefully pick it up, turn it over, and I can place it back onto the watch exactly where it goes. Now you have to be careful putting it back because you can't have that oil spreading around or getting lost along the way. And uh, But once you get it in, then you can take the screw and you can se secure it back to the main plate with the screw. And once I do this with all three of these, then those wheels are good to go, or those uh, jewels are good to go, excuse me. And that means that we can turn our attention to the balance jewels. Now the balance jewels, this is actually the bottom one. These have a similar setup where they've got a circular hole jewel and then a cap jewel on top, but they're kind of contained. And if you look here, they'll come apart in the solution. There we go. So the, the jewel all by itself is the cap jewel. And I'm just gonna give it a quick cleaning as well, manual cleaning with the uh, peg wood. That's because if it has any, again, debris, smudges, dirt, anything on it, it can inhibit the uh, performance of the watch. So I'm gonna do the same thing that I did on the other. I'm gonna take some oil and put it on this jewel here. There we go. And then I can grab the uh, the other part and place it on top and capillary action will make sure that it actually sticks. And then I can take that part and put it back into the watch just like so. Now this part that I'm putting down on the top is one that I mentioned a minute ago. It's this brass ring around the edge that I'm sort of wedging in here. This is actually a shock protection system. It's a spring that says, if you were to drop your watch, and by shock, I mean like a, a hit, not electrical shock. And what it says is if you drop your watch, that that pivot will actually just push out on that spring, either side to side or up and down. And that spring will absorb that energy rather than the pivot, which is like the axle, uh, absorbing the energy and then breaking, which is what used to happen. And this is a little bit of a more later development for watches. If your watch is from the 40s or 50s, it won't have this. But late 50s and into the 60s, it often will. Okay, now we can put on the, uh, I don't know, I guess it's still called the Canon Pinion. But as you can see, there's no friction fit here because that other part does it. This is just the part that the hour wheel goes on to. Okay, now we can start getting some of the calendar works put in here. This is that little plate that covers up that hour part and then that one part of the calendar. And we can secure that down with these uh, two screws here. Okay, and now I can put on the hour wheel as well as this one part here that I mentioned before that kind of clicks over the the calendar and what is oh I see what I did 
So I can put that into place, but I actually put this one screw on a little bit too early because it actually holds two things down at once. It holds down this spring and that plate, but I think I can just remove it and then put the plate into place and then just put the screw back in. Let's see if that works. Kind of clever for them to use the screw to hold down two separate things at the same time. But yeah, that looks like it's working just fine. Okay, so make sure that that's seated and looking good. And I think it is now a little bit of lubricant here just to make sure that uh, there's no undue friction when that part moves around. Although I did put a little bit too much on, so I'll clean it up with my Rodico here. And now I can grab the, uh, the date disc and put it in a place as well. And once again, this is the jumper for the date disc. You can see it pushes up against those little teeth on the inside. And the spring is what uh, provides that tension. Okay, so careful, careful. Easy. Really don't need, okay, there we go, okay. I've already had a bit of a bumpy ride with this one, so I want to keep these springs in place, thank you. And now this cover plate can go on last. And again, this actually holds that date disc in place and also acts as a cover for a couple of the other parts as well. A lot of uh, parts on a watch do multiple functions. It's not uncommon to see that used. It's a way to make fewer materials needed and also to reduce the size of the movement. Okay, another little droplet of oil here for this wheel that uh, turns over that quick date function. And again, a little bit of oil on the inside because it rubs right up against this shouldered screw that holds it in place. Okay, make sure that that's all lined up. And there we go. And now let's test out the calendar. Make sure that it clicks over. Huh. Maybe it didn't actually click over. Maybe the spring isn't lined up properly. Try again. Oh, there it goes. No, it didn't click over. Huh. So I got to figure out what the heck is going on here. And I did. Do you see that right there? That little tiny post was holding up the whole entire date disc. What is that post doing there? That is the other side of that screw. That particular screw goes all the way through to the other side of the movement, which means I replaced it with the wrong one. So let's take it out. And I believe I have figured out that it is the one that I put into the ratchet wheel that is actually supposed to be in there, that it's a shorter post on the screw, this one here, because they look almost identical. So I'm gonna just take this one and put it here and make sure that it fits properly. This is wild. I, these, these screws are so similar. Even for me, like I'm used to differentiating between screws that are just a little bit, tiny bit different, but this one even got me. And yeah, this one of course will fit into here. I, I mean, can you believe that? That tiny difference was actually touching the date wheel or the date disc, excuse me, on the other side of the movement. And it was making it so that it wouldn't turn over. And as you can see, if you look carefully, at the bottom part of the movement there, now that part is not sticking out anymore. It goes right up to the edge. And that's the difference. So now I expect this thing to work. So again, though, in the great tradition of today's rebuild, I have to undo and then redo some stuff. That's part of the deal, though. It really is when you work on stuff like this. Now let's see if it actually turns over. Come on. There. There. Did you see it? It happens really fast because of that extra setup, but it definitely happened and it worked. So that's fantastic. Now we can uh, once again put the balance back in. And once we get the watch running again, 
we can put it on the time grapher to make sure that it's running well. We can also do any regulation or anything that needs to be done there and see what kind of numbers we can get out of this thing. All right, so here we go. This is after regulation. Hey, not too bad, plus three seconds a day. Zero beat error, a little bit lower on the amplitude, but eh, not too bad. We'll probably get a new mainspring for it if we really care about that. But for now, it's keeping really good time and running pretty dang well. So that means that we can continue with the uh, the rebuild here. The next step is gonna be putting on the dial and the hands. I'm just gonna use some Rodico to clean off any sitting dirt or debris that's sitting on the dial. You have to be really, really careful about this though. I know that you might think, hey, it looks like there's some dirt on there. You should just clean it up. It's not dirt. It's actually underneath the clear coat. And if you go too hard at it, you will remove the clear coat. Uh, you will remove the print and uh, it is not pretty. Now, one thing that I noticed as well though is that the crown was a bit loose on the stem here. So I'm gonna use some Loctite to make sure that it stays in place. So you just put a little bit of Loctite on the end of the stem just like that much, just a tiny bit, and then you just screw in the crown and then let it dry. And what it'll do is it'll create a seal there so that it won't voluntarily come off. Now, the purple Loctite is the least holding Loctite, so it actually makes it so you can remove it if you need to later, it just won't happen on accident. Okay, now crystal time. So I'm just gonna go ahead and replace the crystal on this watch. Yes, the old one was probably salvageable, but there's a few things. One, crystals aren't very expensive. And when you get a new one, you know that it's in great shape um, visually, but also that like the plastic is newer. So it's like less prone to cracking or anything like that, any type of damage. And uh, so I always find it worthwhile to just replace the crystal, um, everything else being equal. And there we go. It's an easy job too. So that's the nice part. And as you can see, this crystal looks beautiful on this case and uh, that is ready to go. And that means that we can now put the hands on the watch. In order to do so, we need to get the watch at midnight. And to do that, you do it until right there. Once the calendar clicks over to the next day, you know that it's midnight because that's when calendars click over to the next day. And so now I can put the hands on at midnight. Hour hand goes on and then the minute hand after that. Yeah, it is always tempting to get in on these dials and to start scrubbing around. Like look at the top part of the dial there where there's a little bit of corrosion. It looks like dirt. I understand, it totally does, but it's not. I've had enough experience with these dials, especially from this era to know that that's not how that works. Let's make sure the calendar works. Ooh, very nice. Right at midnight, it clicks over. Similar story with the hands. These particular hands have um, paint on them. So if you go in and try to polish them up or clean them up too much, you can easily remove that paint and then it looks worse than when you started. You have to know how to pick your battles in watchmaking, especially when it comes to dial stuff. Um, some of them are actually pretty amenable to it, but many are not, and this one's not. So now we can complete the reassembly here. We'll start by putting on the uh, other half of the case here. And I think I can just click it together. Yeah, just like that. So that will secure that part, no problem. And uh, let's just give it a quick test now to see how it does winding wise. Beautiful. Okay, perfect, it hit the edge and the hands aren't jumping around anymore. So we solved the problems. Now, ugh, those are the old spring bars that were in it. So we can replace those and uh, take a look after a bunch of baths in the ultrasonic cleaner, all cleaned up for this bracelet. So that came out much, much better, but we do need to resecure it here. So I'm just gonna use a couple of new spring bars here to put this on to the, uh, to the case, case itself. And uh, yeah, these are pretty cool old school flex bracelets. They were very, very popular during the time. They're not anymore. People don't tend to use them very much, but uh, yeah, I my grandpa had one of these. <laughs> okay, so we can put that on and uh, we're just about done with this little restoration here. I'm excited to get this watch back up to Victoria in Canada where it uh, lived for so long with its owner, Jim Hume. 
98 years old and still doing journalism after 70 years up in BC. Incredible career for him. And uh, I'm really glad to get this watch back to running again and hopefully on the wrist of one of his sons in the near future as well. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for this restoration. I really do appreciate you taking the time. And I love going on these journeys with you. Um, if you want to find me on Instagram, my name is wristwatch underscore revival under there, you can find uh, project updates and pictures from my watch collection and stuff over there. Beyond that, we'll see you next time.